so I'm going to take you back in time. We're going to travel back to the mid-1970s. My generation were protesting the establishment. We trusted no one, and we definitely didn't trust anybody over the age of 30. And here I am, 17 years old. I'm a viola player arriving at my first day at the prestigious Juilliard School of Music. I was the first child in my family to get accepted to this incredible school. And I was walking to the Juilliard in New York City, which was a mess and crazy at the time. And I was thinking, I can't wait to go to a music school that embraces all styles and travels diversity and welcomes every type of person. And what I found was a confined box with chains on it. So we're gonna go back to that period of time which was called the Woodstock generation. And that changed everything. It was an explosion. It was the most terrifying moment in musical history for my parents and all the other parents at that time. And it was an incredible time for me because this is where I found my niche and my voice was the Woodstock. In fact, it was named after me. <laughs> um, and what was so great is that where I grew up in the classical world, we had incredibly trained musicians, reading, writing, Stravinsky, Beethoven, and Mozart, all were in our back pocket. But I looked out the window of Juilliard into the dirty streets of New York, and there was an explosion of revolution of music, art, theater, and movies. It was an incredible, incredible time. And then I met the Beatles. One Christmas day, my parents made the fatal mistake of buying me a record called Sgt. Pepper's, and that changed everything. Little did my mother know that this music was gonna change history. I was so into the Beatles that I would draw pictures of the Beatles and me, because every rock band needs a viola player, of course. John, Paul, George, Ringo, and Mark with his viola. Someday I was gonna uh, have that great experience. And that changed the entire concept of my life and my music. So back to Juilliard, I was sort of a lost and confused soul. I walk in, great, my first day at Juilliard, I can't wait to start playing music. What do you mean I have to sit behind this music stand and stare at this conductor waving frantically his hands? What do you mean I can't wear my red sneakers with this tuxedo? Oh my goodness, where am I? So what I found was I discovered an incredible opportunity where either I was born in the wrong century or this would catapult me to redefining how I um, approach music and how I really found my voice and it really was a wake up moment. Not only did I wanna reinvent the music, but I wanted to reinvent the instrument. And just the way one of my biggest heroes was Jimi Hendrix, just the way he changed the perception and went beyond the concept of the guitar, I wanted to do that with violin. And in the back of my mind during this entire time at Juilliard, I could hear this voice, Mark, go back to the practice room and practice your etudes and scales. Practice for 10 hours a day. And I was like, I'm not sure if I want to do that. I need to explore my own voice in music. And for me, that type of education did not work for me. I was definitely not that type. A great, great music school for everybody else, for me. It was the catalyst that changed my life. So back to the epicenter of my life, I fly out of the universe into an incredible musical family and artistic misfits. A concert pianist mother and an abstract artist father, and his family were all woodworkers, and they built religious furniture for temples and churches around the world. So I had this rich, incredible, creative environment wherever I was with my family. It was incredible. My mom had four boys in four years. She had the impossible dream and she achieved the impossible by having a string quartet in her family. <laughs> so check this out, right? This is the 60s, right? You can tell by the haircut. I mean, this is Mad Men, totally, right? This is the 70s. My mother was so nervous. You can just tell by the, the style of the haircuts and stuff like that. But we were the first all brother string quartet in the 1970s and we were tour around playing the great masters of Beethoven and Mozart and Brahms with my mother on the piano. But then I'd run home, put my headphones on and blast Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Allman Brothers and Frank Zappa and I was in heaven. 
So these two worlds were colliding in such a beautiful way. And in addition to that experience, when I was growing up, we were in a tiny little house on Long Island, four boys literally almost stuffed into one tiny room with bunk beds. And my older brother, first violin playing brother, Steve, started to build motorcycles, in fact, drag motorcycles in our room. So gasoline and oil dripping on the floor, eating away at the linoleum floors, and my mother freaking out, saying, oh my God, what is going on here? And I was in heaven. I was his pit crew man. So I would go out with him, and he would be dragging around the town illegally, and it was awesome. So this moment of the dichotomy of a relatively conservative family and the roar of that sound coming out of his motorcycle, that was what, where I found my mission. In fact, the sound of his, here, I'm going to show you, the sound of his motorcycle muffler, I ended up finding the sound on my distortion, my violin, very similar. Check it out. So I was in heaven. I found the sound that I needed to revolutionize the instrument. It was like the combination of these rebellious, crazy kids and frightened parents that was so great to create something new. So I figured it was a time for me to build a laboratory and create a, an environment that I could reinvent the violin and find a instrument that I could express myself. So I leave Juilliard confused and crazed at that point and lost. I decided to move back to my father's art studio, live on the floor, and rebuild my entire life and my voice. The woodshop next door, during the day with woodworkers, they would be building religious and furniture, and then I would sneak in at night and start building electric violins. And this is the first invention <laughs> I can't even look at that picture. <laughs> um, this is the first inventions that I made uh, while I was sequestered in the, my father's art studio. So imagine this. I'm smelling turpentine and oil painting during the day. At night, I'm smelling uh, w um, wood chips and sawdust, so continuously inspiring me. This is one of my first double neck violin, first time in history. I have a 10 string flying V. I've got a glow violin. This violin had a barrel at the end of it that I shot bottle rockets out of. <laughs> and this is a one exactly to my hand that had studs all over it wrapped around my head. Don't even ask about that one. And then I had the first version of my uh, Viper, which I'm playing right now. So it's an incredible moment in time where the violin, viola, cello, and double bass have not changed in 400 years. And here I come along in the 60s and 70s completely relaxed with, I'm gonna change everything. I had no clue what I was doing, I had no training in woodworking, but every day I would go back to the shop, change this sand, that, move this, oh, I, this could be cool, I, let me change that. Of course, a lot of mistakes were made and I figured out and I finally discovered the floating violin, which is my Viper. And this instrument changed my life. So it was really, really an amazing experience. I have the patent on the floating instrument and floating violins, and what I found was an incredible freedom because what inspired me was when I saw Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Page, and all the rock guitar players, they had a physical relationship with their instrument that was fluid, it was sensuous, it was beautiful to watch this movement. And then I would see the great Yasha Heifetz, much different posture. You had Jimi Hendrix burning his guitar, the great Yasha Heifetz was a brilliant violin player, but a much different posture and relationship to his instrument. Can you imagine Yasha Heifetz getting on his knees and lighting his $10 million Stradivarius on fire? <laughs> that would be cool. Just kidding. Um, so this was the world I literally fit into the middle of this hurricane of mastery of classical music and violin with this image in my mind for my entire life. So that was a big, big change for me. I built the first five string, the first six string electric violin, the first seven string electric violin, and it changed everything the way we thought and it went beyond the concept. And these were not novelty instruments, these were instruments that I needed to find my voice. So graduating and moving forward 30 years, 
I've invented and moved all the instruments, the cello, viola, violin, and double bass into the stratosphere. And it's been an incredible experience. And then I discovered an outreach and giving back to the communities as a musician and an artist. And I feel, think that this is the, the moment in time where we really found that the full circle of my career came back to going into schools around the world and empowering kids with music. We do three to four schools a week. We do eight months out of the year. We travel around the world and empower teachers and students the importance of music education. And 15 years ago, when I was in my band, the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, <laughs> and is this an awesome picture? We're in flight. We're literally flying. And at one of our concerts, a string teacher approached me and said, Mark, I, can you develop a rock orchestra at our school? I was like, sure, I guess so. I had no interest in schools, no interest in academic world, no interest in, in boxes to get trapped into. But I walked into that school, and the second I walked in, I realized that this is where we need to be, empowering these kids to find their voices and create that wow moment. So it really changed my whole life and my whole sense of mission uh, because I really believe, like you do, is that the creative thinkers of our country are the ones who change everything. My heroes are Steve Jobs, my heroes are Pablo Picasso, Stravinsky, anybody who thinks out of the box and goes way beyond the concept of their intended mission is my hero. And those are the people I'm fully influenced by. So we go to schools and we share this information with these kids and it's awesome. We have an amazing time with these kids. We are not sitting behind music stands. We are running around, we are empowering these kids and we are encouraging them to think outside the box. It is an incredible um, mission for me after all these years of finally giving back, we've generated millions of dollars for these music programs, and it's awesome, and I am so honored to work with these great kids and great teachers. We're gonna show you a little video of our program. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.